If you have your uh, Bibles, would you take them and go to Acts chapter number 5. Acts chapter number 5, and we're going to read a few verses, starting in verse number 16. I've entitled my message tonight, Ceasing Not to Teach and Preach Jesus. Ceasing Not to Teach and Preach Jesus. Acts chapter 5, I'd like to begin reading in verse number 16. There came also a multitude out of the cities, round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks, and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. Then the high priest rose up, and all that they were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles, and put them in the common prison. The angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors, and brought them forth, and said, Go stand and speak. In the temple to the people, all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came, and they that were with him, and called the council together, and all the senate of the children of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told, saying, The prison truly found we shut with all safety, and the keeper standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we found no man within. Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these things, they doubted of them where unto this would grow. They came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not straightly command you not command you that you should not teach in his name. Behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom he slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior and for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are as witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart, and took counsel to slay them. Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people, and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space, and said unto them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. For before these days rose up Thetis, boasting himself to be somebody, to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who was slain, and all as many as obeyed him were scattered and brought to naught. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee, in the days of the taxing, and drew away much people after him. He also perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men, and let them alone, for if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest happily ye have found even to fight against God. And to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Father, Lord, as we look at this passage, I pray that you would, Lord, um, guide my words. Lord, use me, I pray, to deliver your message. And may, Lord, you give us what we need to hear from your word. May you challenge us and convict us and encourage us where needed. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. In this passage, the apostles are boldly demonstrating their commitment to God boldly proclaiming the gospel. And along the way, as they were proclaiming the gospel of Christ, they faced a lot of resistance and challenges. And with, that, with facing those problems, they, they really they took them on with resilience and faith. Now, I know I'm preaching to Sunday night, so we're very familiar with the gospel. But just for a moment, I'd like us to just consider the gospel and what it is, and just remind ourselves of the importance of the good news. We know the word gospel literally means good news, and truly the gospel is the story of Jesus Christ. Many times people get confused. 
about religion. Because they think it's a bunch of do's and don'ts. And, and uh, you know, we learn that the message of Christ is not about religion, but it's in fact about a relationship. It's not about you, what you can do, but what about Jesus has already done. In John chapter 17 and verse 3, and this is life eternal, that ye might know thee the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I'm glad it doesn't say, and this is life eternal, you have to do all these things, you know, you have to live a good life and do all the, make all the right decisions and make sure all your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, but that's, that's not what is taught. We know that it's through Jesus Christ whom thou hast set. Truly, the gospel is the greatest message that has ever been proclaimed. And today we learn why it is the good news and why the apostles were willing to face persecution, imprisonment, beatings, all for the proclamation of the gospel. And if you're taking notes tonight, first of all, we see the proclamation of the gospel. We witness its spread as the apostles went about engaging in miracles, going all over and preaching about and teaching about Jesus Christ. We're told that it wasn't confined just to the temples, but they were reaching out into homes and going door to door, and they were reaching out into the streets, telling everybody that would listen about Jesus Christ. In our text, we read that they were spreading their doctrine all around Jerusalem. I mean, it, it was a, a dynamic time, and the apostles and the doctrine of the gospel of Jesus Christ was spreading all over the city, so much so that people started to take notice and weren't too happy about what was going on. But as we think about this gospel that was being proclaimed, we see how important it is in verse number 20, as they, at, they were in prison, but verse number 20, 19 and 20, we see that an angel of the Lord comes and, and takes the apostles and lets them escape from, from prison. He releases them, and he tells them, go, stand, and speak in the temple all the words of this life. And I love that, uh, th- that uh, phrase, all the words of this life. Because truly, the, the words, the gospel, is the, the most important message there ever, uh, there ever will be and ever can be. They certainly, truly are the words of this life because without them, our life is meaningless. And without them, we'll spend eternity in a place separated from God, a place called hell. Certainly, these are the words of life. I'm thankful for these words. The words of this life, an incredible way to describe the gospel. These words are vital, and ignoring them leads one to a terrible fate. Jesus said in John chapter 12, verse 47 and 48, And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken the same shall judge him in the last day. And Jesus came not to condemn the world with his message, but to save the world. Men was condemned already, and certainly they are the words of life because the words of Jesus were the keys to eternal life. This is why there's no greater words, no more important words. The good news is salvation, redemption, and hope in Christ. Like the early church, as believers today, we are called to actively engage in the propagation of this gospel, allowing it to permeate every aspect of our lives and reach beyond the confines of our church. We're given the great commission in Matthew chapter 28, 19 through 20, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. We've been told to make disciples and to teach people the doctrines of the word of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The, word may, uh, the world may try to stop the proclamation of the gospel, but obedience to God should, uh, should always be our priority. In verse number 29, Peter and the apostles proclaimed that they needed to obey God rather than man. And even though man told them to put away the gospel, they could not. 
Confronted by authorities and commanded to cease teaching in the name of Jesus, Peter responds, and I love how he responds. He preaches the gospel. Imagine they get, they get imprisoned. They get locked up for preaching the gospel. And then when they, when they bring them and, and, they confront, and they're confronted, what does he do? He repeats the gospel to them. He articulates the core message of the gospel. He tells them about Jesus, Jesus crucified, Jesus buried and risen again. He tells them about the prince and savior of the world. The, cont- the content of their preaching was not personal opinion, but on the truth of who Jesus is and what he accomplished. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, we read, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Before we go any further, I just want to encourage you to think for a moment when you heard the gospel. How about when you received the gospel? A lot of familiar faces in here. A lot of people I know, I've been known for a long time. Over 10 years, some of you. And I know that you know Christ and you accepted the gospel. Before we go any further, I just want you to think about what that was like. To be saved. To be made alive. To uh, be redeemed. To, to have a new home and a new eternal destination. And what that meant when you accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's an amazing thing. I have to often go back to when I was a young uh, boy and when I accepted Christ as my personal Savior. I, had to, I have to go back and, and think about it again and remind myself what it was like to be lost and then to be found, to be saved, to experience the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, maybe you're here tonight and you've never received the gospel of Jesus Christ. I always want to give the opportunity to respond. And, you know, there's only one way to heaven. It's through Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. And if you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, it's never too late. You should know, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, but you need to know that you're saved. You need to know Christ as your Savior. They are the words of this life. Don't miss them. If you miss the words of the gospel, oh, that would be a terrible thing. Especially to come to church on a Sunday night and then to miss the gospel. Oh, oh, that would be a terrible thing. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, if you never personally accepted him, don't, it's never too late. You can do it even tonight. So you think about when you receive the gospel when he accepted Christ. It's a wonderful thing. You know, one thing about the gospel, it's so simple, but it's amazing how easily it's confused. I've been saddened over the years to have people that have shown up at Lionsgate Baptist Church that claim to be Christian, maybe even have attended church in some form for, the most, for most of their life, And yet, they cannot articulate what it means to be saved. They cannot articulate the gospel. You should be able to answer the question, when did you receive the gospel? When did you accept Christ as your Savior? When did you believe and put your faith in Him? You know, it's, it's it's not difficult, and yet the devil has done such a great job making it confusing for people. We're not proclaiming ideas, philosophies, but the unchanging truth of Christ's redemptive work. Is this water here? I can drink it? Okay. My voice is wearing out. C.H. Spurgeon, he said, the heart of the gospel is redemption, and the essence of redemption 
is the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ. Certainly, it's not complicated. The gospel is an incredible thing, and if you've received Christ, remember that. Remember how it changed you. Remember what it did for you. I want you to see number two this evening, the persecution of the gospel. Despite the powerful impact of the gospel, the apostles faced severe opposition. They were arrested, beaten, flogged, and warned to cease their proclamation. The world's response to the gospel has not always been favorable, but the apostles, filled with the Holy Spirit, stood firm in their commitment. It goes without saying that we need to be prepared for opposition. If we're going to continue in pr- to preach and teach Jesus Christ, we're going to face persecution. Persecution may come in various forms. The apostles' example encourages us to endure it, trusting that the gospel is worth any cost. Any cost. Do we really believe that? Do we really believe the gospel is worth any cost? Sometimes all it takes is fear to stop us from sharing the gospel. There's been times where I've had fear. And when I should have spoken up, I didn't. I regret those moments. Moments of fear or just being too involved with my own life and everything that's going on that I am not thinking about others. Yeah, I've, I know the gospel. I'm saved. Heaven's my home. But, but I don't take the time to think about the person I work with, the restaurant that I go to and the person that is serving me, my neighbor that I see almost every, every day. So many people around us have not received the gospel of Jesus Christ. If they were to die, they would miss the words of life. They would spend eternity separated from God. But if we've experienced the gospel and know its power, shouldn't we be able to say like the apostle, uh, the apostle I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of of God unto salvation. Sadly, many are, not, many are not willing to pay the price to, to, to face the persecution for being a bold proclaimer of God's word. Well, I can't do that. They're going to think I'm weird. They might not like me anymore. It's not, it's not the right thing to do. You know, I don't want to be the weird, the weird person at work. <laughs> I, I don't want to face, uh, you know, I don't want people looking at me like that. I want to be accepted by everybody. Well, you know, if we're going to truly proclaim the gospel, we're going to upset some people. The apostles were willing to go to prison. Even once they were released, they obeyed the angel of the Lord and they went out and they again stood and and spake the gospel. And yet, the persecution didn't uh, didn't go away. In fact, they talked about stoning them. They talked about uh, imprisoning them. And thankfully, there there was a guy named Gamaliel that said, hey, listen up, you know, if... There's been, there's, been, there's been preachers like Jesus before, you know. They've gotten up, they've preached, and they've, they've got a following, and even maybe even got a few hundred people to follow them. And, you know, what happened? Once, well, once they were gone, you know, it just kind of died away and petered away into nothingness. This is good. You know, if, if this gospel is just something that man created, it'll just peter away into nothingness. No one will remember, you know, what happened and it'll just kind of go away on its own. We don't have to go and take these apostles and, and, and put them in prison or stone them and kill them because it'll just kind of deal with itself. 
You know, I like problems that deal with themselves, you know, and it's like, okay, do I? No, it'll just take care of itself. You know, unfortunately, <laughs> and maybe fortunately for us, the gospel wasn't a creation of man. It was the plan of God. And here we are thousands of years later, proof that it didn't just peter out and die. Proof that the gospel is not, wasn't a creation of man, but it was God's plan ordained by God. And even today, thousands of years later, just a few weeks ago at Lionsgate Baptist Church, we had a 27-year-old man named Monty accept Christ as a Savior. And the gospel has already made huge changes in his life. I preached this message at our church not too long ago. And uh, he comes up to me the next week, and he's like, man, that was, that was a really cool story about those guys. And I love new Christians. They, they, the way they describe things is pretty exciting. That was a really cool story. You know, that really helped me. I said, how did that help you? And he said, well, when I realized that I could wear it as a badge of honor, that I could go and tell my friends and that the gospel was a badge of honor and, and Christ was a badge of honor, I don't have to be ashamed. Because all of his friends are unsaved. All his friends are already giving him a hard time about going to church. All his friends are, and what are you doing going there and getting caught up in that? And, and he said, you know, when I, could, when I could see them and I could say, you know, I can stand up and I, I don't have to be ashamed and I can face persecution like they did, the gospel is already changing and working in his life. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful thing. Thousands of years later, it didn't just die off. It's still working today. But if we're going to see the gospel go forward, we're going to have to be willing to pay the price. When's the last time you witnessed to somebody? When was the last time you invited someone to church? Hey, you need to come with me. You need to come with me on Sunday. Pastor's going to be there. He's going to preach something that you need to hear. Most likely every week he's, they're going to hear the gospel here at Greater Vancouver. You come. You can hear the gospel. Maybe you can go say, hey, I really need to share something with you. Do you mind if we go get a coffee? And just take them out to Tim Hortons. This is like my go-to move. You know, once you take them out for a coffee and you can sit down at the coffee shop, you have their undivided attention. Hey, I have something I need to share with you because I care about you. I, I, you know, and I, I wouldn't be a good friend if I didn't tell you this, and give them the gospel. When was the last time you witnessed to somebody? When was the last time you said, you know, I don't care what, what's going to happen to me. I don't care if I'm going to be rejected. I don't care if I'm going to be mocked or ridiculed. I'm going to proclaim the gospel. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God. And just like the gospel changed your life, it can change that person you're thinking about right now that person you're praying about right now. But you're going to have to be willing to face some persecution. If the apostles could get locked up and in prison, I think we can deal with the persecution that we have to face. I think we can handle it. Is the gospel worth persecution for you? Is it really worth it for you? Number three this evening, the purpose of the gospel. The purpose of the gospel the gospel propagated because it leaves a lasting impact on the lives of those it touches. The lives, the apostles who left the council did not retreat in defeat. Instead, they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. Their joy was rooted in understanding that the power of the gospel transcends earthly circumstances. In verse number 41, after they were, in, uh, after they were uh, uh, grabbed the, the second time and, and they were told that you cannot preach, you cannot speak about Jesus, in verse uh, number 40 we read, and, he, and to him they agree, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, that they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer sh shame for his name. And when I was, when I was talking with Monty, 
I never used the word badge of honor. That was his word. I just said, you know, what, the, what I read here, counted worthy to suffer shame. But I like the way he put it. The gospel should be something that we can, it's a badge of honor. We, we don't have to be ashamed. In fact, when we suffer for the gospel's sake, we should rejoice. They were rejoicing. Rejoicing. They just got beat. I don't know about you, but if I got beat, I'm not sure I'd be that excited. You know, I haven't been flogged for the gospel's sake, but maybe one day, I don't know. Maybe it might happen. They just got beat up. They were messed up. And yet, they were rejoicing. Rejoicing that they would suffer for the gospel's sake. Do you know why they were willing to do that? Because the gospel is life-changing and life-saving. It was so important to the early church that they continued their mission, teaching and preaching Jesus, both publicly and from house to house. They knew that without the gospel, there was no hope and no purpose for life. In Ecclesiastes, I've been doing a series in Ecclesiastes on Wednesday nights, and if you like to be, you know, depressed, you could always read through Ecclesiastes. Um, you know, life is meaningless, it's vanity, it's vanity, and all of that, and uh, it's, got, it's not all depressing, but it's, it's kind of, you know, the... Solomon, I think Solomon wrote it, but he, he took a very stern, you know, he's a stern critic in, in Ecclesiastes. In Ecclesiastes 6.6, 6, we read this, Yea, though he lived a thousand years twice old, told, yet hath he seen no good, do not all go to one place. If there is no God, if this life is all there is, and Ecclesiastes 6 verse 6 is talking about something, somebody who has everything this world has to offer. In the very beginning, it talks about a man to whom God gives, who has wealth, possessions, and honor. He lacks nothing. He's got everything this world desires. So think about that for a moment. You know, think about somebody that's got everything this world has to offer. I mean, Solomon said that everything, you know, he, he spared nothing from himself. He had it all. Everything that you can think of that you want. You know, the, the nicest house, the nicest cars. He, you know, it's more than just wealth. He had wisdom. He had everything that you could possibly have. He had fame. He had power. Everything. Without God, without God, it is meaningless. The emptiness of the things in this world even the best things in this world, if we separate them from God, who gives us those things and praise? If we separate them from God, they have no meaning. You can spend your whole life. And I hope you, I hope you have a wonderful blessed life and I hope you have a, a nice home to live in and have a great job and I hope you have all the things that you know, bring some enjoyment to life. You know, God doesn't say they're not bad things. We can enjoy those things as we have them day by day. But if you gain everything this world has to offer and you don't have the gospel, it's a waste of a life. And the gospel is so important. We ought to devote some time to sharing it, to being a witness. You don't waste time when you share the gospel. We can waste time a lot of ways, but we don't waste time when we share the good news. The message of the gospel is that he has made eternal life possible for all who trust in him, for all who center their lives around him. The power of the gospel is transformative, not only in the lives of those who receive it, but also in the lives of those who proclaim it. We can find joy in the privilege of sharing the gospel. Trust that its power it's greater than any opposition we face. You know, I think what stops us is we don't, we don't believe in the power of the gospel like we ought. We live with fear and doubt 
and we forget what the gospel can do. The reality is there are people all over our city that are looking for hope. They're looking for something. They might not even know what they're looking for, but they know they're missing something. And we have the answer. The words of this life. They are the words of this life. They're the most important words. We don't waste time when we share the gospel. And it's, it's such a great responsibility that he's given to us to share the gospel. We need, we need to get back to the basics. And the gospel that changed your life it has the power to change someone else's life. And you need to believe that. You need to believe that the gospel, it's not, it's not man's message, it's God's message. God's, God is behind it. The Holy Spirit uses his word. And he is still changing and saving lives today through the message of the, of the good news. And you need to believe that and then be willing Be willing to suffer persecution for its sake. Be willing to take a stand and proclaim the message of Christ. And say, you know what? Persecution can come, but I'm not going to be ashamed because I know the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation. And I have a friend that needs to hear it. And I have a coworker that needs to hear it. And I have, you fill in the blank, somebody that needs to hear the gospel. At our church on Wednesdays, we've been, we have a prayer list and we've been putting names on this prayer list for salvation. It's kind of bothered me that sometimes we have this prayer list and nobody wants to actually put their, their list on, you know, their people they're praying for. I'll be like, I know there's more than seven people that need to, you know, be saved. So we need to fill this list up. And so what I did is I gave everybody a sheet and I said, look, I want you to write down 10, 10 people that you know that need to hear the gospel. Ten people. And it didn't take long for everybody to write down ten names. In fact, I told them, listen, don't write the so-and-so family. I want you to write down every name. Give me their first names, and we'll put them on the list. So on our Wednesday night, I have, you know, I'll give you an example. I have pastor, and I have ten names behind my name. Ten names of people that I know. And I'm thinking about, uh, I'm thinking about my na- neighbors, Jerry and Vera, um, from China. They've been my manager now for, for 10 years. They've been to church. We've been in the church before. Vera just had um, surgery on her liver on Friday. And if they were to die right now, they don't know the gospel. And I want them to know the gospel. I want them to be saved. But over the years, I always found I'd give, make an excuse why I can't proclaim. <laughs> well, you know, I don't, my, they're my managers. I don't want them to get upset at me. I got to deal with them on a, big, a regular basis, <laughs> you know. I'd always have reasons why I couldn't just go and communicate with them. But I was reminded that she went in for surgery on Friday. It's pretty serious surgery. Had part of her liver removed. You never know how much time you have. You never know. And I have a great responsibility because they're my neighbors. And God put them there next to me to proclaim the gospel. And the gospel is powerful. I, I, I have to stop convincing myself it doesn't work anymore. Because <laughs> I do that sometimes. Oh, they won't listen. They won't respond. They won't hear. They won't understand. It's not what I want. As we think about the gospel, may we continue to go back to that, the, the, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can never get beyond that. We can never outgrow the gospel. Let us be inspired by the apostles' unwavering commitment to teach and preach Jesus ceaselessly. 
as we proclaim the gospel, as we face persecution, may we trust in the purpose and power of the gospel. And may we follow in the footsteps of those like the apostles who laid the foundation of the early church. And they did it by preaching Jesus Christ. Let's be a people that are willing to proclaim Christ and the gospel, willing to face persecution, willing to understand the purpose of the gospel. Jesus came to do this. It's the reason why he came, to seek and to save the lost. It's a wonderful thing. I pray that it will be a help and encouragement to you. And as you go home tonight, I hope you think about some people that you know that need to hear about Jesus Christ. And I, I pray that you'd have the courage to go and figure out a way that you can communicate with them and share the gospel. Because if you don't do it, they may never hear it. Believe that the power of the gospel is still relevant today, still change lives today. And it can. It can. If we're willing to proclaim and be a witness, let's pray.